There have been rumours for years that this, the most spectacular main line in England, was to close. British Rail finally confirmed the speculation on the morning of Thursday the 17th of November. Now the fight is very much underway. For against British Rail is ranged the most powerful opposition they've faced since the days of Dr Beeching. The settled Carlisle, it seems, is something special. The questions are these. Do you run a railway to serve people or to make money? Can you, in fact, do both? Can public services survive without subsidies on a common market scale? The settled Carlisle is an acid test of the will of British Rail, of Whitehall and of the objectors. Because these days, heritage, romance or no, it's money that counts. Legal machinery to close down the line is already well underway. The final date for objections is the 4th of February, and there'll be a public inquiry late in the summer. British Rail will try to show that the Settle Carlisle is a hangover from another railway age. What they really want are fast electric high speed trains running either side of the Pennines, east and west, instead of aging diesels running across them. The Settle Carlisle crosses 72 miles of mountain and moors, the very roof of England, where the winters are long and hard. At over 1,100 feet, it's the highest main line in the country. It's also the bleakest and the most remote. 6,000 navvies laboured seven years to build the line. More than 100 died. It was the last great epic of the Victorian railway age. In fact, the Settle Carlisle should never have been built in the first place. It's the result of bad-tempered rivalry between the old railway companies. A piece of commercial madness which left British Rail saddled with three routes between England and Scotland. Here's how the network looks at the moment. The West Coast Main Line, London, Manchester, Glasgow. And the East Coast, London, York, Edinburgh. And between them, the Settle Carlisle linking the Midlands and West Yorkshire with Clydeside. The closure plan involves cutting out passenger services altogether, closing the middle section and keeping a limited freight service at either end, between Carlisle and Appleby and Settle and Ribble Head. The symbol of the line's growing decay is the magnificent Ribble Head Viaduct, a quarter of a mile of Yorkshire limestone, which now is showing its age. The rock is cracking under the strain of more than a hundred winters, and British Rail say it'll cost between four and a half and six million pounds to repair. A joint action committee has been formed to fight the closure plan. They say the line would have a lot more to offer had it not been sabotaged by British Rail. Until a couple of years ago, the line carried the Nottingham-Glasgow Expresses, six trains a day. All that's left now are 17 abandoned stations, four small local trains, and virtually no freight at all. The objectors have a sneaky feeling British Rail are deliberately running down the line to strengthen their case. They call it closure by stealth. The line has a distinct air of dereliction, but the campaigners believe it still isn't too late to save it. Even so, they admit the obstacles are enormous. The main obstacle in the short term is British Rail itself. If we could um, change even slightly British Rail's intransigent attitude towards this line, we feel that uh, the long-term probability of success would be greater. But they are really digging their heels in and they are producing and have produced cost estimates which really indicate that they're going to come out with guns blazing to, to, to persuade us all that the line is in fact not only uneconomic but very, very uneconomic. This line has got a lot to offer. It could be used as a tourist line. If you combine that with the use as a diversionary route for the main line when there's engineering works on the main lines, uh, the normal social uh, benefits to the people of Settle and Appleby, 
uh, there's a lot of things that once you add them all together the total uh, outcome on the line could be enormous the potential is there if it would be utilized but it's not seen that way i think they're going to put up a tremendous fight it's a very emotive issue this it's a very emotive railway line it's possibly england's best loved railway route and it's inevitable that there'll be uh, an awful lot of objectors I i've heard a, a figure of 1000 uh, when the closure procedure is finally invoked I think they're, they're very well organised. Uh, they seem to have some very clear-headed, um, clear-minded people at the top of the organisation who have some background knowledge of how railways are financed and how railways operate. I think they'll put up a tremendous fight. If that fight is lost, then those who suffer will be the people living high up in the Dales. On summer weekends, the remote stations are reopened for the hikers' specials. The service is called Dales Rail. The trains are chartered by the West Yorkshire Passenger Transport Executive and operated as walkers' excursions. More importantly, perhaps, Dales Rail gives the locals the rare chance of a trip to the shops of Leeds or Carlisle. You know, and there's not so many means of getting away where I live. We, we have a very poor bus service. I should be very sorry to see it close. Because mm -hmm. I've come on quite a lot and I enjoy them. You yes. Know. yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel just the same about it. It's a rare opportunity for Dale's people to get away once a month during the summer, which would be impossible if, uh, if the line closed. Mm -hmm. We all come about 18 to 20 miles. Well, I do in any, in any case, and some people come further by bus right up here, and uh, we get away, have a chance to visit friends, as I'm doing today. But that will go completely if the line closes. Dales Rail has been a remarkable success. This is the last train of the season, and the longest. 12 carriages and they're all full. The campaigners say it shows the potential of the line. As they keep telling British Rail, if you market the attractions of the Settle Carlisle properly, you're onto a winner. Here's Garth, Castle Gordon, return. Here's Garth, Castle Gordon, return. Here's Garth, Castle Gordon, return. The walkers all know about the threat of closure. Recently, the line's been carrying a lot more people, wanting one more trip before it goes. They haven't got the profit-making potential of regular commuters, but they do have a deep affection for the line. Well, um, I come from the Lancashire side of the Pennines, and um, um, on the first Saturday of every month, the, the, there's a train from Liverpool which picks up at various stations in Lancashire and joins the main Dales Rail train at Tellyfield. And as you can see today, there are 12 coaches full, six of them coming from Lancashire. This has been going on for several years now, and um, uh, it, would, it would mean that the Dales were virtually closed from people from the Lancashire side of the Pennines. This, this essentially uh, is why the line should be retained. It, it provides a means of transport for people getting here without their own car, reduces overcrowding on the roads, and it also makes it possible for people to have a very pleasant day out in the countryside, along with guided walks and a scenic rail, and a scenic railway line to ride on. I met a lot of friends on this train. It's rather nice when you come here, beginning of the month, and uh, there are people you know. So really, I would miss that. It's recreational use, really. Plus the fact that it is the most scenic railway in the country. And I think, from that point of view, it'd be a shame if it went. It would take a good lawyer to convince Whitehall that the settled Carlisle should be saved on those grounds alone. But the leader of the campaign, John Whiteleg, still holds to the concept of a social railway, which couldn't be replaced by bus services. He believes, quite simply, that the people of the Dales need trains, both for social and economic reasons. I think that what we have here is a very good example of a rural railway line in Britain. It serves some very remote communities in an upland area. A lot of tourist jobs are dependent upon it. A lot of people live in this area who we think would like to continue to live in this area. And good quality transport keeps people in areas, stops young people moving away. And so it's an important facet of the economic structure. It keeps the areas alive and thriving as opposed to being dead with people moving out and uh, houses being sold for second homes and so on. We think that's very important. So economic arguments, social arguments, arguments about the role that the line could 
take up within British Rail and within the region and nationally. It could become uh, a useful freight line for British Rail taking some of the traffic off the East and West Coast main lines. It could develop a lot of revenue. We think the tourist potential of the line is grossly underutilised. It's already, I think the figure is it provides 70% of the Steam Locomotive Operators Association's revenue slower and in that sense that could, that could be much boosted and provide revenue for British Rail. Why is that not being developed? As far as British Rail are concerned, the future of the Settle Carlisle is a matter of hard economics. Repairs and maintenance to the line have been reduced to the absolute minimum. And when the gangs turn out nowadays, it's only for the most urgent jobs. Some sections of the track have been waiting two years and more for repair. It just isn't worth the expense of improving the service. For British Rail are short of cash now, and getting shorter. In August, British Rail announced a plan to cut 17,000 jobs and 1,900 miles of track, including the Settle Carlisle. Within five years, they said, the cost of Britain's rail services to the taxpayer would be down by 25%. Now the government have told them that's not good enough. Nicholas Ridley, the new man at the Department of Transport, has given the hard word to Bob Reid, the new man at British Rail. Instead of five years, he's got three. He's got to work with a smaller subsidy while still keeping fares down, maintaining a good service and avoiding a major programme of line closures. Well, now Mr Reid knows where he stands. And that certainly doesn't make things look any brighter for the Ribblehead Viaduct, a symbol both of the line's majesty and its decay. The Victorian engineers chose the toughest building material in the world, Yorkshire Black Limestone. But even that hasn't stood up to a century of high Pennine winters. The asphalt waterproofing at the top of the viaduct has broken down through lack of maintenance. It was to have been resealed as long ago as 1981, but the work was cancelled. And with an average of eight feet of rain a year, the rubble and mortar inside the piers is gradually being dissolved and washed away. Ribblehead viaduct is weakening all the time, a fact of which the civil engineers are only too painfully aware. Well, it's got a fundamental problem um, which is unusual in engineering structures, and that is that the material itself uh, has now completely uh, life expired. So the stone is actually crumbling, is it? The stone itself is decaying, yes. How long have these cracks been appearing now? The first um, evidence of cracks like this appeared round about 1970. There were hairline cracks at that time, and emergency repairs were carried out by means of strapping the ends of the piers together. The domino effect is a worry, and this is uh, if this piece of rock collapsed one day, the cracked rock above would fall down, and the cracked rock above that would fall down, and the end of the pier would then be displaced, uh, the spandrel above it would fall outwards, uh, leading to possibility of a train coming out of the side of the viaduct. As well as the cracks in the stonework, there's that other threat to Ribblehead. Rainwater seeping into the rock is weakening the ancient structure still further, partly by the action of frost and partly by dissolving the very core of the piers. If we have a look at this crack just here, you'll see that because the waterproofing has broken down on the arches, water is making its way down into the piers and is coming out through these hairline cracks and through the mortar joints. Well, that is leaching out the mortar and putting point loads onto these very large blocks, which in turn are cracking. What we've done, we've cut out the very badly uh, cracked stones, we've tied the corners together by means of tie bars, and we've tied the ends back into the centre of the pier by means of rock bolts. Is this a permanent solution? This is a permanent solution for those building blocks that have been so dealt with. But unfortunately, it doesn't mean to say that the next row uh, won't decay on us next year. Are you saying that the entire bridge will have to be replaced completely, or could you perhaps just keep on repairing it as you have been? It's possible to keep repairing it um, for the next three or four years, perhaps, depending on the severity of the winters. But the propagation of cracks and the deterioration is far exceeding the maintenance work and the repair work that we're doing. In my opinion, in the opinion of the region, and the opinion of the board, and in the opinion of consulting engineers that we've brought in, 
this is no longer repairable. British Rail have spent £600,000 on Ribblehead since 1970, but it's now in a worse condition than when they started. Replacement costs are put by British Rail at up to £6 million. There are those in the opposition groups who say it wouldn't cost anything like that. There are those who want to know why British Rail underspent so heavily on its 1982 repair and maintenance budget. Officially, it was due to the Aslef strike, but maintenance work is done by members of the NUR. And why, in the autumn of 1982, were British Rail still insisting they had no plans to close the line, when this internal document, the case study for the closure of the settled Carlisle route, was issued a full year before? Was it, as some cynics suggest, an attempt to stop it from becoming an election issue in the safe Tory seats along the line? As the line stands, it's plainly uneconomic. There's virtually no freight, and only four passenger trains a day. That's because most of the traffic the line used to carry, the cargo work and the Nottingham-Glasgow expresses, has been diverted to boost the earnings of the West Coast main line. The opponents say that's downright sabotage. Take away a railway's income and it's bound to lose money. Alan Whitehouse has uncovered a curious example of BR accountancy. It's another internal document listing budget figures which appear to show that, for no good reason, the settled Carlisle has suddenly become dramatically more expensive. It's suggesting that diesel fuel, which cost £59,000 last year, will this year cost £147,000. Now, by comparison, uh, Shell UK said that the price of diesel fuel to a medium-sized fleet operator has gone up by 12%. Well, with the best will in the world, £147,000 isn't a 12% increase on £59,000. Uh, similarly, for train crew costs, this is purely the, the time that the crew spend in the cab driving the train. Last year the allocation was £11,000, this year it's £27,000. Uh, railway workers this year, or rather last year, got a 4.5% pay rise. And um, that again doesn't equate with these figures. British Rail over the last few years have certainly changed dramatically. Uh, there are still a lot of people in British Rail who want to run railways with a good network. There are a lot of people in British Rail who very, from deep down reasons, feel that we have to cut the network back. They feel that if we're going to have a railway that is ever going to have a chance of being profitable, it's got to have a lot less track and a lot lower overheads. And we feel that this management attitude has become really well entrenched so that at the one level, if you're going to be promoted even and do well within British Rail, you have to be seen to be rather hatchet-like in what you get up to. What are your views as a railman yourself about the way British Rail have handled this? I think they're going about it uh, as it's reported in the, in the press recently. It's, it's closure by stealth. They don't seem to be giving all the facts. They seem to sort out the facts that they want to release, um, facts that they think uh, are in their best interests. And people in the know, railway people, uh, people that work on the railway, that work on this, that, this line, they know, they know what, exactly what's happening. And it doesn't do um, industrial relations, if you like, any good when British Rail put out comments that, uh, shall we say, aren't quite uh, what they seem to be. British Rail's great advantage in the fight is that they have all the figures, the number of passengers using the line, the income, and the running costs. With that in mind, a group of local authorities along the line, led by Cumbria, are organizing their own 30,000 pound independent survey. They want hard evidence to counter the British Rail case at the inquiry, evidence of the hardship that closure would cause, Evidence of the line's potential for development. Evidence on costs. The councils know as well as British Rail how carefully priorities must be assessed before limited public money is spent. And privately, some of them are distinctly gloomy about the prospects of saving the line. Richard Hargreaves among them. For him, it's a classic case of romance against realism. Well, that's right, yes. First of all, having lived up within sight of the line now for nearly 17 years, and having travelled almost daily up past Gribblehead Viaduct, I don't think anybody could 
escape having a romantic attachment to the line. You think back to the way in which it was constructed over a hundred years ago, when you think of the times that people used bog carts and drag stone across the, to form the embankments up at Batimos and lived in encampments there. There were nearly 6,000 people working on the line at the peak time when it was being constructed. And when you go down Chapeldale and look at the little churchyard and see all the graves that were there from the cholera victims of the epidemic that spread through the people building this line, it's almost impossible not to have a tremendous feeling of the heritage and the history that went into this, the last great Victorian epic of railway construction. On the other hand, um, having been a North Yorkshire County Councillor and representing something like 6,000 people over 150 square miles, I look back to the sort of epic struggles that we've had, spending nearly seven years to get the funding for a ground floor library in Bentham so that people with arthritis and old age pensioners and so on could change their library books. I think of the controversy that's raged about having to stop school swimming lessons and having to charge people for transporting children to school because they live within the certain three mile limit and this sort of thing. And it does provide a very, very great difficulty for anybody in this situation. Uh, when, it, when one actually talks about the funding of a line of this nature. So is it then a battle between heritage and plain economics? Yes. How would you describe British Rail's attitude to settle Carlisle? Is it some, some millstone round their necks? Well, I think you know, the straight answer to that is yes, it is. The whole of the case rests entirely on a financial basis, because it's costing us an awful lot of money. It's a very heavy loss maker. And we're here as a business, and we've looked at the whole thing, the whole strategy, corporate, in a corporate uh, manner. And there are three main lines to Scotland, you know. And we're quite satisfied that the East Coast and the West Coast can handle the traffic. The line itself, as I say, is going to cost us nearly £7 million to bring up to uh, running standards for the future. And it's losing somewhere in the region of £1.5 million a year. How can you defend yourself against these accusations of closure by stealth and massaging the figures? Well, I don't think that's true. That's not true, because many years ago we did say, in fact, 1968, in the longer term, it was the intention to close the Settle Carlisle route. And that's 15 years ago. There's no question of us massaging figures at all. There's no point. And as I said, the feature is that those figures that so much have been talked about do not even feature in our closure case. As Alan Whitehouse knows, the British Rail case for closing the Settle Carlisle has been prepared in secret, shelved, dusted off and redrafted over many years. Does he believe the opposition can reverse all that at the last minute? It was a tremendous task. Um, British Rail have a lot going for them uh, when it comes to railway closures because they present the facts and figures and the opposition has to argue uh, against those facts and figures. You've no idea how those facts and figures have been arrived at because British Rail's accounting procedures are incredibly convoluted and it's often difficult to understand how they've arrived at any particular decision. But just because British Rail wants to close a railway line doesn't automatically mean it will close. The final decision comes from the Secretary of State for Transport and uh, there are many, many examples of railways which appear doomed uh, which have been reprieved at the last minute by the Ministry of Transport, the Department of Transport. Closing down a railway is no simple matter. The legal machinery for it is laid down in the Transport Act of 1962. First of all, British Rail have to publish what's known as a notice of closure. You then have six weeks to object in writing, but only if you can prove that you use the line and that its loss would cause you personal hardship. Then there's a public inquiry organized in this case by the Transport Users Consultative Committee in York. They will only listen to cases of hardship. The law does not permit them to consider emotional arguments like scenery and heritage. Which way will the inquiry find? I think the problem with the, 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 the TUCC public hearing will be that they've got to prove hardship and hardship is generally accepted to mean people who can't get to hospital as easily, uh, children who can't get to school as easily, or people who have the, an incredibly difficult job just getting down the road to get to shops to, to get the weekly groceries. And I think in this case that will be tremendously difficult to prove.
Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Could I welcome you to the second of a series of public meetings? These public meetings are convened by the... The campaign against closure gets underway. At Skipton Town Hall, the interested, the faithful and the committed gather to talk about something they've all seen coming for years. Too little, too late, perhaps. Now, though, they're no longer grumbling about rumours, but fighting a bold fact. ...continues to see the presence of a first-class railway with first-class facilities into the foreseeable future. Yes, uh, Chairman, uh, following on that, the New Statesman had an article a few weeks ago, uh, it, was, it was not the one on the line, it was the one on the Serpa report, in which it said that there was a secret memorandum, there was a secret, secret document circulating in British Rail which showed that Settle Carlisle Railway, in fact, made a profit last year. I've Have you not, heard information on that? No, I've no information which relates specifically to any secret document. Um, I doubt very much. We would certainly not be so foolish as to doubt British Rail's primary claim that the line does not make a profit. A well-run line that is well patronised, that has many trains a day, that is adequately marketed and that fulfils a large local need, generally makes a loss. Now you can tackle ministers and you can tackle MPs and you, you can tackle top BRB officials about this and of course they'll always hide behind the statement well it's a commercial judgment for British Rail but at the end of the day what we've got to realize like many other industries the nationalized industry of British Rail is being slowly choked in relation to investment the questions about Riblehead Viaduct a moment ago um, there's a lot of people that share a fear like me that if the public inquiry goes against British Rail as we hope that the dirty tricks department, if you like, will come along halfway through it and say the viaduct's unsafe and close it down that way. Now, did the committee think that that will happen? And if so, what can be done about it? We do feel from a strategic point of view that to concentrate on the viaduct is not going to help our case in the long run. The Rebelhead viaduct could have been repaired nice and cheaply many years ago, as most civil engineers would be able to tell you. The campaign could begin tonight by people leaving this hall, by pressurising Politicians, it doesn't matter whether they're local politicians or national politicians, because at the end of the day, it will be a political decision that will decide whether this line stays open or not. If we lose the arguments, and we're not contemplating that possibility, many more lines in England, Wales and Scotland will in their turn be exposed to what is a very chill wind of those that want to cut the railways. Please go away, fired with enthusiasm that we can win this battle and we will win this battle. And thank you very much for coming tonight. It would be easy to turn the story of the fight for the Settle Carlisle into a caricature. In one corner, the faceless state-owned monolith. In the other, a well-meaning gaggle of conservationists. It isn't, of course, as simple as that. The final decision will be swayed by political influences, as well as social, economic, and possibly even sentimental considerations. But there is one factor at work which gives the fight for the Settle Carlisle an added urgency, the Pennine weather. If another hard winter gets its frosty fingers into this ancient stonework, the line could turn from a public asset into a public hazard. Without a firm decision soon on the future of the line, all the talking will have meant nothing. The Rebelhead Viaduct could have been repaired nice and cheaply many years ago, as most civil engineers would be able to tell you. The campaign could begin tonight by people leaving this hall, by pressurising politicians. It doesn't matter whether they're local politicians or national politicians, because at the end of the day, it will be a political decision that'll decide whether this line stays open or not. If we lose the arguments, and we're not contemplating that possibility, many more lines in England, Wales and Scotland will in their turn be exposed to what is a very chill wind.